welcome to The Fitterist Show with your host, Christopher Allen, where we explore the art of mind and body conditioning. Welcome to this episode. My name is Christopher Allen, and I'm the host of The Fitterist Show. And in this episode, you're going to learn three things. One, what are macronutrients and what are the macro categories and what are the sources of each of those categories? Two, how to calculate the approximate number of calories you should be taking in each day. And three, some key pointers on how to adjust your macro splits. That is, how much protein, how much fat, how many carbs should comprise your caloric intake calculated in the previous step. So let's start with the basics. What are macronutrients? There are three major categorization that include protein, fat, and carbohydrates. So let's start with protein. And protein is essential for the growth of new tissue, new muscle tissue, hormone regulation, enzymes. It's pretty much the building block for the entire human body. And some of the things that it does, it transports molecules throughout the body. It helps repair cells. It protects the body from viruses and bacteria. It helps to promote the proper growth and development of the human body. Sources of protein include poultry, so things like chicken breasts, egg whites, red meat, fish, tofu, lentils, skim milk, and there's other low-fat dairy products like yogurts. And then, of course, there's protein powders that are in this category as well. And this will come up in future calculations, but proteins have four calories per gram. That'll be pertinent to our calculation of caloric intake later. Second category, fats. Fats are necessary for things like energy. They support critical functions, hormone production, nutrient absorption, body temperature maintenance, Um, Healthy skin and nails, they help you absorb many vitamins, especially vitamins, the fat-soluble vitamins, hence appropriately named, A, D, E, and K, and they are energy-dense, so they have 9 calories per gram. I'm going to go into a little detail on the types of fat, because fats are a little bit more complex. There are... A couple types of fat. There are saturated fats. These are the unhealthy fats. They raise your LDL, which is your bad cholesterol level, which also increases risks for things like heart attack, stroke, other major health problems. So you generally want to kind of avoid foods that are high in saturated fats as they also facilitate increased cholesterol buildup in your arteries and blood vessels. So some of the sources of saturated fats include things like butter, cheese, whole milk, ice cream, cream, and fatty meats. So the second type of fat are unsaturated fats. These are the, quote, healthy fats. Now, to add a little bit of complexity, there's two types of unsaturated fats. There are monounsaturated fats, which actually help lower your LDL, lower your bad cholesterol, and they help to develop and maintain your your cells. And example sources of monounsaturated fats include things like nuts, avocado, canola oil, olive oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, peanut oil, peanut butter, ah, peanut butter, uh, sesame oil, and egg yolks. Now, the second type of unsaturated fats are polyunsaturated fats. These also can help lower your LDL, your bad cholesterol levels. These include the omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, which are essential fatty acids that the body needs for brain function and cell growth overall. And the most important thing is our bodies do not make essential fatty acids. So you can only get them from food or ingesting them from supplementation. So the omega-3 fatty acids, they reduce triglycerides, which is a type of fat in your blood. They reduce the risk of developing irregular heartbeat. They slow the buildup of plaque and they slightly can lower your blood pressure. Whereas omega-6 fatty acids help in the control of blood sugar. They can reduce your risk for diabetes, and it also can help lower your blood pressure. So some of the sources of polyunsaturated fats include walnuts, sunflower seeds, flax seeds, flax oil, fish, things like uh, fatty fish like salmon, albacore tuna, trout, uh, some corn oil, tofu, and chia seeds. So those are the polyunsaturated fats. The third type of fats that I'm going to talk about are trans fats. Now, trans fats are 
probably the worst fat for your health. They are These are the liquid oils that are turned into solid fats during food processing. So processed foods will have a lot of trans fats in general. Trans fats can generally be found in a lot of fried, fast, packaged, processed foods. Anything that is fried, battered, anything with shortening, margin, cakes, pies, pastries. And this includes... A lot of big categories. So this includes like fast food, snack foods, fried foods, and baked good industries. We're talking multiple billion dollar industries that have historically been built on a lot of trans fats. Also things like animal foods, red meats, and dairy, they have small amounts of trans fats. They're not laden with processed trans fats, but most trans fats come from processed foods. Equally important, your body does not need trans fats. There's no essential processes in the human body that require trans fat. In general, you should try to eat as little trans fat as possible. These trans fats also raise your LDL, your bad cholesterol, and lower your HDL, which is your good cholesterol. So high LDL levels along with low HDL levels can, again, lead to cholesterol buildup in arteries and increased risk for heart disease. Also, eating too much trans fat can cause you to just gain weight and put you at risk for things like type 2 diabetes. And many foods that are high in trans fat are also very high in sugar, which adds to the overall caloric intake. So common sources of trans fats, not surprisingly, cookies, pies, cakes, biscuits, donuts, breads, crackers, frozen dinners, pizza, ice cream, (laughs) milk, all the good stuff, (laughs) milkshakes, uh, a lot of snack foods, and a lot of fast foods. So when you're in the grocery store, I would encourage you to read the labels of packaged foods closely to really help you understand fat concentrations that are in common products. So as an example, like Lay's chips, just as an example, are about 57% fat. There's no trans fat in those chips, but A serving is almost 60% just fat, which makes a glazed donut at about 48% fat look almost healthy. (laughs) But of course, the glazed donut has generally another roughly 20 plus grams of sugar. So even though the donut's a little bit lower in fat and it does have a little bit of trans fat, it also adds in a healthy dose of sugar. So in general, trans fats should be avoided. Okay, so that wraps up the fats discussion of the second. Remember, the first was protein. The second category of macronutrients was fats. And the third that we're going to talk about now is carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are an important source of energy for the body. The digestive system changes carbohydrates into glucose. Your body uses this sugar for energy for your cells, tissues, organs, and generally stores extra sugar in the liver and muscles for when it is needed later. And as you might expect, there's also a breakdown in carbohydrates. There are simple carbohydrates. These are things that include sugars that are found naturally in foods like a lot of fruits, some vegetables, milk, some milk products. And the second category is complex carbohydrates. These include things like whole grain breads, cereals, starchy vegetables, legumes, things like that. And carbs also, like protein, have four calories per gram. While it's technically true that the human body doesn't need carbohydrates to function. In this case, the brain actually uses something called ketones, which is derived from fats for energy. However, many carb-containing foods are healthy and nutritious, such as vegetables and fruits. These foods have all sorts of beneficial compounds and provide a variety of health benefits. And in my opinion, it's tough to eat no or near zero carb diet for a prolonged period of time for most people. So keto diets absolutely have their place. Are they sustainable for a long period of time for most people? In my opinion, not really. So I don't shy away from carbs, but as you'll see, there are good carbs and bad carbs. And the delineation between what's a good carb and a bad carb generally flow from things closer to the original state that have fiber, as an example, versus processed carbs that are generally stripped of their fiber. So let's dive into some good carbs. So good carbs, vegetables. Everybody eat your vegetables. Been a staple recommendation in diets for 
many, many years. Whole fruits, apples, blueberries, bananas, strawberries, legumes, lentils, peas, kidney beans, nuts, things like almonds, walnuts, macadamia nuts, peanuts, seeds like chia seeds, whole grains, pure oats, quinoa, brown rice, and potatoes and sweet potatoes are example of good carbs. So switching to bad carbs, and you'll see a recurring theme here. These are refined carbs and processed foods in general. So one of the biggest culprits uh, of bad carb intake is sugary drinks, things like soda, Gatorade, vitamin water, lots of sugar laden in a lot of those drinks. Fruit juices, usually high in sugar. White bread, if you look at white bread, they have refined carbs that are really low in essential nutrients. Obviously, things like cookies, pies, pastries, and cakes that we talked about before, where they're generally higher in sugar. Things like ice cream, candy, chocolate, again, a lot of the good stuff. And chocolate's also high in sugar. So you see kind of a recurring theme here of good carbs, bad carbs. And I'll throw in, uh, since I gave an example before, we have French fries and potato chips generally much higher in fat and they land on the bad carb list. In general, if you're eating well, i.e. you're minimizing some of your refined and processed foods as part of a balanced diet, you should absolutely not fear carbohydrates. Okay, so at this point, we've covered the three major macronutrient categories, protein, fat, carbohydrates, what they are, some of the pros and cons, and some of the sources of each of those. So now let's move on to talk a little bit about why you might want to track your macros. For myself, and what I typically do with my clients, is to first and foremost get a baseline of one's current diet for one to two weeks. So just to know where your starting point is at. And of course, it's important to be honest when you're tracking your baseline and include everything. The goal is to get better. And starting with an accurate baseline is the first step. That includes things like drinks, including alcohol and things like that. Logging your meals and food intake. There are many different apps that are available in the marketplace. Some are free, some are paid. I'll run through a a couple really quick. My Fitness Pal, this is the app that I personally use. It's free. It can take a little while to set up, but if you generally eat a lot of the same things, once you set it up once, daily tracking is very quick. There's also apps, MyPlate, MyMacros Plus, Nutritionix Track, Lose It. There's a number of different apps. And look, if you use this Excel spreadsheet or Google Sheets, if you want to track macros as well. Another tip is investing in a good digital food scale to ensure that you're actually consuming what you think you are, not what might be on a package, It's just good to get in the habit of weighing the food item after cooking, ensuring the best accuracy so you know exactly what you're ingesting and how much. So once you have a baseline, we can take a look at a guideline, and I'll stress guideline calculation of caloric intake and macronutrient breakdown. So the question that this tries to answer is, how many calories should I be consuming? And the first step is we want to understand the energy your body needs just to do its normal processes, day-to-day living, and this is called the basal metabolic rate, your BMR. And there's a couple different formulas for the calculation. I will put in the show notes uh, a link to an online BMR calculator. There are, again, three different formulas, and they take factors into consideration such as age, gender, height, and weight. So there's the Mifflin St. Jor BMR calculation model. There is the second one is the revised Harris Benedict model. And the third is the Catch McCardle model. And that third one also requires a current body fat estimate as an input variable to calculate your BMR. So again, you can go to www.calculator.net slash BMR dash calculator dot HTML. And again, I'll put this in the show notes. so You don't have to remember that. And the show notes will be at www.fitterist.com forward slash 005 forward slash, since this is episode five, make it easy. So there's a number of variables using the calculation and just using myself as an example, 
I put my variables in there and on the first one, the Mifflin St. Jure model, my BMR was 1862 calories a day. On the second one, the revised Harris Benedict, my BMR was 1964 calories a day. And in the catch McCardle, my BMR was just over 2000, 2040 calories per day. Now, once you have your BMR, you need to add in your activity level to get your total daily energy expenditure, your TDEE. Again, this is an estimation based on these models and activity level, and it's all in that online calculator link. It automatically does it for you. For me, in my case, I exercise five days a week. I do fasted cardio, so I personally fall somewhere between the three to four days per week category and the six to seven per days category in the table. And so my approximate TDEE, my total daily energy expenditure, with the three models, came out as follows. The Mifflin St. Jor model, my TDEE was 3,000 calories a day. The revised Harris Benedict model, my TDEE was 3,150 calories a day. And the third one, the Catch McCardle model, my TDEE was about 3,300 calories a day. Again, just estimating here, because at this point, what we have is a guideline from which we can start to make decisions and changes to our diet. My TDEE is essentially an indicator of my steady state caloric expenditure, including my normal exercise routine. So in theory, right, I would generally maintain if I ingested the same number of calories as my total daily energy expenditure in, in calories, I would maintain my current weight. If I want to gain weight and add muscle, I will need to increase my caloric intake. And conversely, if I want to lose weight, I need to decrease my caloric intake, assuming my exercise routine is constant in both of those examples. So obviously you can either decrease your caloric intake and increase your exercise, decrease your caloric intake and maintain the level of exercise. Both of those will help to lose weight and then the converse if you're trying to gain weight. Okay, so at this point, we have our total daily energy expenditure calories. And of course, the next question is, how do I break down those calories and distribute it across macros? How many grams of protein, fat, and carbs should I be eating? Well, there are typical generic ranges that have been established. There, again, is no one-size-fits-all here. These variables are highly dependent on your personal lifestyle, your nutrition and fitness goals. You know, look, people like endurance athletes might need, well, do need, higher carb intake. And someone on a keto diet will have significantly lower carbs than any of these general guidelines. But there are general guidelines that do exist. And those ranges are as follows. For protein, roughly 10% to 35, 40% of your total calories. Fats, roughly 20 to 35% of total calories. Carbohydrates, 45 to 65% of total calorie. So continuing with my personal example, let's say I'll choose my TDEE using the first model where it was at 3,000 calories per day. This will just make the math a little simpler and I'll take my time walking you through the math here. Let's say I wanted to gain a little bit of weight, so I wanted to skew it a little bit more toward protein intake and carbohydrates and a little bit maybe less in fats. Let's say I choose protein 40%, fats 20%, carbohydrates 40% as my macro split. So to calculate the number of grams of each that I should ingest based on my numbers, we would take for protein 40%, and I'll just walk through the math slowly here, 40% multiplied by the 3,000 calories, which is my TDEE, which gives you 1,200. And you have to divide that by four because each protein gram has four calories, which gives you 300 grams of protein per day. The fats calculation similarly is 20% times that same 3000 giving you 600. But remember fats have nine calories per gram. So you have to divide that 600 by nine and get 67 grams of fat per day. And similarly carbs, since I put that at 40%, that's going to calculate to the exact same thing as protein which is roughly 300 grams of carbs per day. This is not too far off of where my diet 
actually is. I do try to skew a little bit higher in protein and I can tolerate a little bit higher in carbs. So in this case, I would compare my baseline diet with my targets above and then start to make adjustments to meals, whether that's the timing of meals, the composition of the meals, the food sources, or the breakdown of the macronutrients. So when you construct and revise a diet plan, one also needs to take into consideration lifestyle factors that need to be accounted for, right? So when and what time can somebody eat? They have access to a microwave. What does their daily routine look like? Because the key here is to make it doable. The goal is not to be down to the exact calorie. And did I have 286 grams of protein or 327 grams of protein? But I'm within a given tolerance range. You don't generally want wild swings in your diet, but you also want to make sure that there's flexibility so that you can continue and execute on your plan. And remember, this is just a starting point. You're going to learn. You're going to adjust. You're going to modify your diet. You might decide to get up and go for a walk in the morning, which changes some of your caloric expenditure. And you're going to find something that best fits your lifestyle, your daily routine, and best align with your fitness and lifestyle goals. And by doing so, some of the benefits of tracking macros that I've seen for me are one, I'm just, I have a heightened awareness of food consumption. When I'm being honest and I'm putting in that I ate a donut and I see what that does to my numbers, it honestly makes me think twice before I make future food selections when I'm actually tracking my macros. It also helps me to focus on the impact of food choice as it contributes to my overall diet plan. And it can help though with very specific goals. If I'm trying to lose weight, gain weight, maintain, it gives you a great guidance of knowing that you're continually ingesting the right quantities of food in the right proportions to help achieve your goals. And I think it generally promotes healthier eating. You know, it, the old adage, if you want something to move, measure it. And tracking your macros is basically measuring what you're eating in a day. And I think it does improve the quality of your all diet. And maybe most importantly, it gives you the confidence and knowledge about your body, your diet, what works best for you. It doesn't mean you need to be on 24 seven. It just means that you have the confidence of tracking that to again, stay within that tolerance range as you align your macros with your lifestyle and diet goals. Now, a couple of other comments Tracking macros might not be for everyone. Truth be told, I probably track macros for probably four to six months of the year. I've been managing my diet for decades, so I have a generally good feel for how my body responds to food, but I do find it very beneficial to track whenever I do a, a cut where I'm trying to get leader and thus I'm on a stricter diet. Then I always track my macros because it just provides an objective measurement of how my, I am progressing. Also note that just because one is tracking their food, it doesn't mean they're eating healthy. There is a, if it fits your macros camp, that generally allows for any food consumption as long as it fits into the macronutrient amount set for a given day. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. So if you have a cookie at work, it can still fit in there. But you just want to make sure that you're not eating cookies or donuts every day and filling up the fat macros right away and that's not necessarily an overly healthy choice also if you see my instagram you'll see that i'm a believer in a cheat meal saturday night saturday night cheat meal baby and i do this once a week for myself saturday night and note that i didn't say cheat day i said cheat meal for me and again i generally have a higher metabolism and i eat generally pretty well but i do find benefits in a cheat meal one i'm more likely to stick to my core diet plan for a much longer duration without any binging or any slips if i have a cheat meal once a week and it's something i really look forward to i look forward to that splurge meal it really helps me mentally as i'm making progress through my diet i think it also helps shock the metabolism and it gives you that mental break. For me, I almost always do a burger and fries as my cheat meal. I just have found over the years my body responds well to that cheat. And it's something that I really do enjoy. I know there was a lot to take in in addition to the math calculations along the way. But I hope it 
provides you with at least a foundational understanding of macros, how to get a baseline, how to construct and track a starting point diet with calories and the associated macro breakdowns across protein, fat, and carbohydrates. This is why with my clients, I prefer to have a period of time to experiment with variables in the diet. Some people respond differently to different foods. Some people need to see what works uniquely for that client. And a diet plan is unique to each person. There is no one size fits all. This will absolutely work. Remember, the art is in all of the adjustments, the substitutions, the slight modifications to the diet plan. As you learn, as your exercise becomes more consistent, you tailor your diet, tweak it, to optimize it for you. Finally, I'd like to close with a quote from Jack Ma, who is the founder and CEO of Alibaba that seems at least tangentially related here. And the quote is this, quote, if you put bananas and money in front of monkeys, they will choose bananas because monkeys don't know that money can buy a lot of bananas. Similarly, if you put money and health in front of people, people tend to choose money because too many people do not know that health can bring more money and more happiness. With that, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen to The Fitterist Show. You can follow us on Instagram at Fitterist Mind Body and on Twitter at Fitterist Mind. If you enjoyed this episode, please send it to a friend or subscribe to make sure you don't miss any future episodes of The Fitterist Show. My name is Christopher Allen, and make it a magical day.